Hi, I'm Scott Robinson, director of the REIT Center at NYU Shack Institute of Real Estate. I am fortunate to be co-hosting our REIT Leadership Series with my friend and industry colleague, Robin Panofka. Robin co-chairs Wachtell Lipton's real estate and REIT M&A practice with Adam Emmerich, both of whom have long supported the Shack Institute of Real Estate, notably as conference co-chairs of our annual REIT Symposium held every spring in New York City. Today's conversation is with Jim Taylor, president and CEO of Bricksmore, which he joined in 2016. Bricksmore owns a national portfolio of more than 370 retail centers comprised of 66 million square feet and trades on the New York Stock Exchange under the ticker BRX. Prior to Bricksmore, Jim was CFO and treasurer of Federal Realty Trust, another retail REIT, and he was in the investment banking uh, industry prior to that. Jim is also vice chair of ICSC and serves on the executive board of NAREIT. I'm very appreciative of Jim's time today, particularly for the insight he is providing to our students. I also want to thank the many NYU Shack students who participate in this series, including today's co-host, Ryan Alexander. Um, I mean, Jim, obviously we're 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 delighted to have you here and we're delighted to have you, you know, share your thoughts on on the industry you're in and and things more broadly as well in the real estate world or the economic world. Um, you know, just be, I mean, try to avoid talking too much about COVID and that whether the world has changed irretrievably and how, how you see it, you know, whether we're at an inflection point or how you see the future, but obviously with all of your, you know, open air retail space, just curious to get your perspectives on how that's been a strength uh, during COVID and what sort of permanent change or, 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 um, or work you have to do now now that now that COVID is winding down, if if indeed you're seeing it wind down in terms of people's behaviors. Well, you know, it's a great admonition in terms of not being defined by COVID. Uh, and quite to the contrary, I think what COVID did was accelerate a lot of trends that we were already seeing. Uh, the profitability of the store for the retailer being chief among them. Um, you know, four or five years ago, pre-COVID, one of the internal debates you would hear from many of the tenants was that competition for capital between the online platform and the store platform. You know, we began seeing that competition relent a bit as the retailers realized that they needed a store to serve the customer, that that was the primary way to retain a customer. And most importantly, it was profitable. Um, and you know, it's been interesting. COVID only accelerated that. You know, we had we had the moments at the beginning of COVID, as everybody will recall, where it was scary. We were all looking into an abyss. We had 40% of our tenancy closed, it would be non-essential. Um, yet, you know, very quickly we were surprised. Uh, you know, the tenants began to rebound. And, you know, one of the interesting things that happened through COVID that no one predicted was the credit quality of our tenants improved. Uh, the weaker tenants moved out, um, but those tenants that had access to the capital markets were able to get liquidity and fortify their balance sheet, and then essentially accelerate the trend that you know we're talking about, which is which is really the importance of the store. And as it relates to open air retail, having a store that's convenient and proximate to the customer. Um, it has been, I think, a real strength of the format. Um, as I like to say, one of the great things about open air retail is it's basically a pretty industrial building with a nice facade. It's structurally very simple. All the HVACs on the roof, um, the electrical service comes from behind, it's back loaded, which means you can move walls, you can change prototype. Um, and you can be flexible with what your tenants' needs are as those needs evolve. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the, 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 the asset class itself, and I mean open-air retail, I've never seen a stronger supply-demand environment for landlords. There's basically been no new supply and tons of net new incremental demand, not only from our core tenants, but from mall-native tenants, from tenants that provide services and health and wellness and beauty and fitness and restaurants, et cetera, that funnel of tenancy that's coming into the open air format is as wide as it's ever been. And what that's meant for us as a company is we're setting records in terms of rate and occupancy mm -hmm. all time. You know, this company has been around for a long time. We now own about 400 shopping centers 
Um, it's a different portfolio than when I started, but even so, you know, to be able to say we've never hit 94% occupancy, we've never realized average rates above $20. Those are all the things that we're seeing today. And, you know, it's really something that COVID really accelerated. It didn't, it, the business didn't transform because of COVID, if that makes sense. But you're taking share effectively from other retail formats is basically what I heard you say. And I think we're not only doing that. So imagine, imagine you're a mall native retailer in mm -hmm. line with the mall and the department store is closed. Right. The benefit of your bargain is no longer there, right? right. You're paying higher cam, higher rent based on the traffic being generated by that department store. It's no longer there. Plus, it's inconvenient at times for the customer to go to structured parking to walk several hundred yards to get to your store. What the open right. format provides is visibility, you've got signage, you've got ease of access, um, and lower cost. You know, the, the cam charges for an open air center are a third of what they are in mm -hmm. an enclosed mall. So your cost of occupancy is lower. You can sustain higher profitability with lower traffic. So, you know, you've seen a lot of the mall native tenants come out in vision, jewelry, uh, footwear, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of those uses that have, you know, uh, kitchenware, uh, interestingly, a lot of those uses have now come into the open air format, but at the same time, we're capturing share, you know, we're, we're seeing a bunch of new businesses mm -hmm. come in to the open air format, whether it's medical, as you continue to see a lot of medical services being provided on an outpatient basis, coming out of hospital campuses, going into more retail formats to, um, you know, interesting new fitness concepts to, you know, retail service businesses mm -hmm. And it's a, it's just a much wider funnel, as I said before, of, of demand than we've seen in the past. Um, and so what that means is, you know, as I mentioned, we're setting records as to occupancy and rate. And the way we're doing that is, you know, the classic having more than one tenant competing for one space, right? Mm -hmm. We're not splitting atoms. If we can generate competitive demand for the space that we have coming available, not just yeah. currently available, but coming available in 23 and 24, we can drive much better outcomes. So are you are you bearish on malls, even where they are today? I think that the very best malls will continue to survive. I think they're going to change, but it's really the middle. You know, it's really those malls that aren't offering the customer something unique or special or capitalizing on density and demand and demography to be mm -hmm. a relevant destination. So um, I think there's, you know, a, a big segment of the mall space that's going to suffer and continue. And to your benefit, actually. <laughs> yeah. You know, look, it's, it's, uh, it's partially to our benefit, right? You know, because if you think about it, one of the things you have to be careful about as a landlord is the credit quality of your underlying tenancy. So if you have a tenant that's yeah. got a lot of exposure to weak malls, you know, they, they may not be the best credit proposition. Mm -hmm. Got it. Got it. Interesting. Well, you touched on it a little bit in terms of the store, you know, being profitable uh, in terms of the mix online. How do you see that, you know, having developed over the last COVID period and I guess more important, you know, sort of the next five or whatever it is years in terms of online share or the symbiosis between the online and the physical and all the rest of that evolution? Well, I think the retailers recognize that the store is a primary part of the channel is serving the customer. And, you know, a lot of retailers are doing it differently. They're doing, you know, fulfillment out of the store. They're doing fulfillment on the curb. They're encouraging the customer to come in the store. They're finding ways to have the customer share in the cost savings of the last mile mm -hmm. and, still, and still be profitable. Um, and what's interesting to me is there's no one model that, 
you know, is predominating other than, you know, the fact that the store is central to serving the customer. And when you listen to the earnings calls of the retailers and they talk about their strategy, you hear them talking a lot about the store. Another thing that we've been seeing for the last several years is that when a retailer closes a store, you have something called the tether effect, where you've got a lot of online sales leave that submarket because it's no longer served by a store. So mm. the smarter, better retailers are able to really assess and identify better than ever before, not just the volume that's going to be going through the four walls of the store, but the volume that's supported by the store. Um, you know, sometimes that gets you into esoteric discussions, Adam, about how do you capture that your share of those sales? Right. You know better than I do. Documenting that's a nightmare. So what what we try to do is just reflect that in the competitive dynamic that we mm -hmm. we we gain when we have more than one retailer competing for a space. Um, and I think that you know what's interesting is this supply demand fundamental. Even if we come into a economic slowdown in 23, I think it's going to persist in part because of the capital markets disruption that we're seeing. There's really no new ground up development going mm -hmm. on right now. And if you're a if you're an entrepreneurial local developer, you're just going to have a tough time getting a project financed unless you have all of your leases signed and mm -hmm. you have a really strong relationship with the bank. So, you know, that says to me that we're going to be seeing no new supply for the next several years. And it's actually interesting when you go back and you think about other retail real estate cycles, we were always our worst enemy. You know, we would overdevelop at absolutely the wrong point in time. And typically we'd be coming into economic softness with overcapacity. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're not seeing that now and uh, puts us in a better position, I think, to outperform as an asset class. And as far as Amazon is concerned, are they sort of just sui generis? They're the only people who are all digital? I mean, of any major quantity size? Well, you know, Amazon continues to look at store formats. You know, you've got the Amazon Fresh and you've got other concepts that they're looking at as a way to sort of capture the customer. And so, mm -hmm. you know, obviously Whole Foods was a big transaction for them. And, you know, I think they're going to continue to innovate in ways of serving their prime customer out of their store fleet and making things even easier for their customer. Um, but, you know, and there's plenty of other online only businesses out there, but I liken it to the catalog business of the past. You know, there's there's just not the same loyalty or connection with the consumer that a retailer who's a great merchant and who has a physical location can compete with. So in terms of the, the dynamic, you, you don't see Amazon or other online only retailers sort of taking huge galloping share over the next years. I think, you know, there was a period of time during the early stage where you saw that as a pretty steep curve. Mm -hmm. Looking out over the next couple of years, it's going to moderate and probably grow with retail generally. Yeah. I'm not saying it's going to shrink, but yeah, yeah, it's it's. I think we're we're kind of past that early adoption phase, and now we're in a more mature phase of online versus in store. In terms of sort of, I don't know if this is maybe a hybrid. One thing I wanted to ask you about was was grocery and all the you know, uh, shopping services where you see so many people in the grocery store nowadays who are, you know, tethered to their device and, and, and pick, you know, acting as pickers. Where do you see that, that going? Will there be different kinds of facilities for picking versus shopping or? Well, each retailer is doing it differently. Um, HEB has an interesting format where they actually have an entire separate third of the store designated for uh, online uh, fulfillment where, mm -hmm. you know, all of the grocery items and other things other than perishable and prepared foods are actually outside the store as a way to ease traffic in the store. And then the perishable items, you know, get shopped and then come through the online segment of the store. Mm -hmm. 
to others that are utilizing lockers and fulfillment areas within the store itself. And, and it's different in each format. So there's a bunch of different ways that they're trying to address that problem of the shopper experience um, and which you're kind of hitting on. And I think they're doing a pretty good job. I mean, one of the things to look at is how much of the pandemic boost the grocers have been able to hold on to mm-hmm. in the year or two subsequent. And it's actually quite significant, which I think speaks to how the grocers have upped their game in their product offerings and the prepared foods to bring more customers into the store. Um, and, you know, it's always, Adam, been the most competitive business ever, mm-hmm. right? When you, when you think about the margins they're competing on, they're razor thin. And think about the the multiplicity of channels through which you can get groceries. You can get them at Target, you can get them at yep. Walmart, you can get them at BJ's, you can get them at mainline groceries, you can get them at specialty groceries, you can get it at dollar stores, you can get grocery items in drug stores for crying out loud. So, you know, against that backdrop, what's encouraging to me is to see some of the major grocery operators continue to be competitive, continue to retain on their retain a big big part of the COVID bump, but also, and importantly, they're investing in their stores. So as a landlord, uh, that, that in addition to new store opening plans is a really key indicator of their commitment to the store and the importance of the store. Now, are you partners with those users in, in technology or otherwise, or you're, you're facilitating their business in a sort of traditional landlord kind of a way? You know, we are always the partner of the tenant. We will fight over rent and restrictions and exclusives and all that. But once yeah. we've gotten that out of the way, yeah. we're actually incredibly aligned with the tenant. And, you know, we're putting our capital to work alongside the tenant's capital to make sure that they're getting their store open on time into prototype. So that partnership, actually, I'm glad you mentioned it is very real and very important to the retailers themselves. I mean, imagine if you were the head of real estate for Burlington and you had yeah. a you had an objective of opening up 30 stores this coming year, mm-hmm. you're going to lean heavily on well-capitalized, proven, you know, landlords yeah. in a disrupted environment, right? Because if you're trying to get it done with a private landlord in our space is still 90% held by private um, owners, are they going to be able to get their construction financing? Are they be able, going to be able to yeah. get done on time? So that partnership uh, matters. But as it relates to technology, um, not really. You know, we, we um, try to stay more in our lane. Uh, where we've invested a lot is in data, um, particularly with the advent of traffic data uh, to just make smarter capital allocation decisions. Mm-hmm. And it's an exciting new area of growth for us. Fascinating. I mean, it's, for Jim, that's a great segue to another question I'm sure people would love to hear your thoughts on. I mean, what what is it that's driving, if you want to call it stickiness, or I don't know what the right word is, um, uh, you know, inertia, that why is 90% still in private hands in terms of, you know, all the great benefits of, you know, liquidity and 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 support in the capital markets for, for, for tenants as much as anything else? You know, uh, a big part of it has just been the history of, of uh, how the industry emerged. I mean, when you talk to a lot of the real estate firms, it always tickles me. They'll call you a developer, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Because they're, they're thinking 20 years ago where as a retailer, you partnered with local sharpshooter developers to get shopping centers open and and so forth. And, you know, um, there is a tremendous amount of private capital that's still directed towards the stability and cash flows of the open air product Mm -hmm. type. Now, on our side, you know, public companies like ourselves or Federal or Regency or Kimco or Kite, um, you know, we've, we've, not been in an environment where there's uh, profits to be made in spread investment. 
right? Mm -hmm. we, don't, we don't have a cost of capital that's so compelling relative to the private owners that we can go out and grow just through mm -hmm. acquisition. You know, yeah. that hasn't been the case actually for net lease companies. And I, I would love to have that burden of, you know, trading at an implied premium to the mm -hmm. real estate value. But for whatever reason, I know there are many, um, the public REITs within the open air sector, but also within a number of them, haven't been able to um, consolidate as aggressively as you might otherwise think. So what that what that's meant is we have to generate growth through reinvestment, through um, you know, blocking and tackling, leasing, et cetera. Do you think there is going to be some kind of inflection point that you can see out on the horizon in terms of um, you know, migration or growth through acquisition into the public sector? It'd be a lot of fun. And you know, <laughs> we're, we're, uh, we're certainly ready and waiting for it. Um, but you know, Adam, you and I actually crossed paths in the early 90s uh, when uh, we were working on a security capital uh, transaction. Yep. And, you know, that was the heyday of spread investing, right? Like you didn't have an integrated platform. You didn't, it wasn't that hard. You just had to go out and buy stuff. And <laughs> that, would be, <laughs> that would be a lot of fun, um, but unfortunately not, uh, not where we are today. Now we'll see things happen in cycles. And, uh, you know, I do believe that we have a business advantage over the smaller landlord. Mm -hmm. Why is that the case? Well, we do have access to capital. It may be yeah. high price, but we have access to it. Um, we've got the recurring uh, track record with these national and regional retailers that actually matters. It gives you the lean. You know, if you have a national retailer looking at a REIT owned shopping center versus a privately owned shopping yeah. center, they're going to lean towards the the yeah. uh, read owned shopping center, um, and uh, I I think that as the business continues to evolve and is capital intensive, um, it's just harder for a private landlord to compete. You know, we talked a little bit about data. Um, we use data extensively. Every renewal, we will know how that particular retailer is doing relative to the chain nationally in the state in the submarket and that's that's very valuable information that if you're a private landlord you're probably not accessing you're mm -hmm. probably relying on a third party broker whose interests aren't necessarily aligned with yours to make some of those decisions so you you, you develop all that data internally well we rely on third parties like placer credit mm -hmm. cell and a couple of other platforms mm -hmm. and then we take that data and you know we look at it 80 different ways we manipulate it we um we actually brought in on board uh, an individual that used to run site selection for target so we mm -hmm. kind of understand how the retailers are using the data to mm -hmm. monitor sales um and again those partnerships and relationships with the Retailers gives us a lot of insight in terms of how a particular unit is doing and, um, you know, whether or not we're getting enough rent for it. It's fascinating. Um, let me shift, shift gears for a minute, Jim, in terms of, you know, again, obviously we're in a, I read Howard Marks's latest newsletter over the weekend. His headline was Sea Change and the Interest Rate Environment. Do you do you think we're in a blip? Uh, and if we're not, how do you see things, you know, adjusting to a new, you know, high rate environment that's going to persist for some indefinite period of time? I think the disruption is going to continue for a while until the Fed stops. And, you know, and I think they're probably going to overcorrect. Um, Yes, I think a lot of the data that they're relying upon is somewhat rearward looking. So you think about things like housing, it just takes a while. You know, with that said, there's plenty to be or optimistic about. You're seeing declining costs of energy, declining costs of transportation, freight. Um, you're, you're seeing um, 
decline in the monetary supply. So I'll leave it to people who are much smarter to try to figure out what the landing is going to be um, over the next several quarters. Um, but let's face it, we were in a period of time with artificially low rates, and it's hard for people to wrap their head around it, that the rates today aren't that high historically. Yeah. So where we settle out you know, remains to be seen, but I like asset classes like ours that even in an elevated rate environment can earn a rate of return that covers that risk-free rate and provides you growth and um, is somewhat defensive. Nothing's perfect, but you know I like our mix of necessity and value-based retailers mm -hmm. against what might come from an economic standpoint. Yeah, and, you know I'm also, <clears throat> you know, really encouraged by the continued traffic levels we're seeing at the at the stores. What the tenants' demand is for new space, and you know, remember we're. We're really doing business not for 23 right now. We're doing business for 24. Mm -hmm. um, and we we have a pretty good handle on what 20. One of the things when I first came into this side of the business that actually shocked me is how much is already in the cake a year out. Right. I mean, you, you're 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 really playing over the next 12 months for a couple hundred basis points of revenue. Think about it. There are not many businesses like that. And yeah. we're actually setting up revenue for 24 and 25, um, giving us visibility on implicit growth, even with a um, even with a disruption. Right. I mean, you you talked you talked about, you know, rates not being all that high right now. Obviously, you were, you know, pretty smart in locking in some pretty low rates on a fixed basis and your balance sheet looks you know, fabulous. So did you, you had well, that? I'd like to say advanced. that we were prescient and brilliant at the same time. Uh, no, you know, actually, sorry, I've got a little bit of a glare here. Um, oh, good. So our philosophy as it relates to the capital markets is never be in a position to have to raise some capital at a particular point in time. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? That means raise it when you don't need it. That means always being opportunistic. If you see if you see rates go low as they did last year, we we raised four or six hundred million dollars at two and a half. We didn't need the money, but we just said feels pretty good, right? Yeah. Let's go ahead and push out our maturities. You know, the break even on the treasury to pay for the for the um, prepayment. I think the treasury only had to move twenty eight basis points. It's like that's an easy call, right? Yeah. Like. We fall out of bed and do that. So where companies like ours get in trouble is when they um, put themselves in a position where they've got to fund something within the next couple of quarters. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's just not um, something the public markets will give you latitude about. And do you think, though, that the, the new interest rate environment will sort of permanently impact equity valuations as well? I think it's already running through the equity valuations. Um, yeah. I think I think on a private market basis, it hasn't yet fully flowed through in terms of where cap rates are. There's a certain level of grieving that has to occur by the private owners who otherwise would be sellers. Fortunately for our asset class, less grieving than maybe low cap rate assets like multifamily and industrial where cap rates came inside of where the treasury was, we, we were always wide of where the treasury was. So, you know, what that means is for a great grocery anchored center in Florida, maybe the cap rate before was five and a half. Today, it's six and a half. Big move in value, right? But a hell of a lot better than going from a three and a quarter southeastern multifamily asset to a four and a half or a four and a quarter. Mm -hmm. You know, the math just isn't your friend. Yeah. Scott and Robin, I don't want to prevent anybody else from jumping in with questions. I'm going to maybe pivot if you want. We're getting pivot to sort of career and student type of questions, uh, but happy to happy to have any more questions. Jim, if you're you're willing on these core kind of business, capital markets, public company type of stuff. Absolutely. 
Yeah, look, um, thanks, Jim. I appreciate all this. And, and I think, you know, demonstrative to your point that you're probably taking open air centers are taking business from the mall centers and 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 the retail climate in general is still fairly healthy. If I look at your redevelopment portfolio, um, you know, it's not converting space to residential or logistics. It's it's kind of repositioning for other retail users. So, you know, I thought that was a pretty strong data point for that. But maybe part and parcel of that you guys are also running an entrepreneur's program. Uh, it seems like a strategy where you're making it easier for startup firms to, you know, to get space, to lease space, to kind of understand where they should locate. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, we're we're doing a lot of things, helping these smaller retailers with their social media presence, um, which has been huge. Um, we have greatly simplified our lease form. When I came on board for a small shop lease, I think it was 70 pages. We've gotten that down to seven. Um, which compresses the time frame and also simplifies things for the tenant and you know helps you avoid uh, big, big legal fees. Yeah, big, <laughs> big legal fees. Sorry, Adam and Robin. Oh, no good. No we, we, we're we're going to work it down to three and a half. <laughs> um, and you know, we also through our our temporary uh, leasing program do some temp to perm programs where. We'll take a risk with a particular tenant who's unproven um, at at a lower rate, less long term commitment, less capital, if any, from us, and see how they do. And that's that's a pretty exciting area for us, particularly as it relates for you know small shop tenants. I think one of the things that landlords get a really undeservedly bad rap for is that or maybe we're not given credit for is that we're actually putting capital to work alongside these business owners to a much greater degree than the local banks. You know, we're, we're building out their stores. We're giving, we're providing them capital for financing their equipment and everything else. And yet, you know, we're seen as the big evil yep. landlord all the time. And yeah. I think it's something that, you know, whether it's the entrepreneur program, whether it's our specialty temp to perm program, whether it's the initiatives that we're doing on social media, but even more broadly, the capital that we're putting to work in these communities is quite significant. And oftentimes, you know, we're we're taking equity risk, if you will. Now, granted, it's supported by the underlying real estate, but, you know, um, and, and we're providing them a, a cost of financing, if you will, that um, is obviously attractive for them. Yeah, which is one of the benefits of being a you know public company and have, have balance sheet you have. So yeah, um, maybe part and parcel with the entrepreneurial you know mentality. Uh, I know Ryan was kind of excited to ask a, a few uh, questions for you. Fire away, Ryan. Yeah. So first of all, on behalf of all of the uh, students, I wanted to thank you for taking the time. I could tell you from personal experience that these kind of conversations uh, being presented in the classroom and in our own free time and being able to watch them is extremely valuable uh, for students. Um, so I guess my first question is, and I know that, you know, no parent is supposed to pick a favorite child and hard to say, but I'm curious, you know, from your perspective and looking at your tenants, who or what sector, I guess, would be get you out of the picking someone uh, has been really thriving um, post pandemic and really performed well during the pandemic and showed that uh, kind of creative mindset to keep their retail presence alive and thriving. Every one of them. I mean, you know, it's there that you, you have some standouts. You've got the value guys that took capitalized on the supply chain disruption. You've got uh, the grocery, you've got the specialty grocery. You know, the shockingly, fitness came out of the pandemic incredibly strong, and we have much better capitalized fitness operators, very high margin business, great entrepreneurs. Um, and, you know, they've, they've been doing very well to all the different service businesses and restaurants, quick serve, um, other other types of uses that have thrived through the um, you know through this part of the cycle, which has been different than other cycles that I've seen. Usually, you have a certain level of retailer disruption in a particular category, um, 
you know, for example, a few years ago, it was office supply um, mm -hmm. or, you know, uh, electronics or what, whatever it might be. And that was part of the dynamic nature of being a retailer. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I like to always say is we're actually not in the retail business. We're in the retail landlord business. So we're not taking the same level of uh, volatility, if you will, that some of the retailers themselves experience in their business. Um, so I don't really have a favorite. You know, I, I would tell you that what I get proudest of and our purpose really as a company is about is to creating a center that's the center of the community it serves. And you know it when you see it. It's no longer a Bricksmore center. It's, you know, uh, Plano's center, right? And that community embraces the center. They're proud of it. It helps define the community. And so when you ask me, well, what uses do I like? I like the ones that are relevant to that particular community. And it's different in each area, you know, and some uh, home goods and jewelry do well and others medical services and dental do well. It just depends. Um, but I know we've got it right when the community thinks it's their center and they don't really think about it as a Bricksmore asset. If they think about it as a Bricksmore asset, we're probably not doing our job right, you know? And so one of the things that I really focused on joining the company six to seven years ago was you know, culling the assets that didn't have the potential to become the center of the community and recycling that capital into assets that we saw real upside potential. And that's how we've been creating value. That's, that's great. And I know, um, you know, relevant to your point about your centers being kind of the, the focal point of the community and being part of the community rather than uh, one of your centers specifically, uh, I know many uh, operators in your space have a significant portion of your retail space being leased by kind of local um, stores. And I think, you know, the industry defines that as uh, sub three or four locations uh, in the area. So did you see those, those kind of that specific tenant performing well and, and surviving, you know, of, of course, they're going to have a harder time than a huge national bank or something like that pulling through these turbulent um, times did you see, have you seen them recover well and and continue to perform well well you know we call that the mom and pop retailer you know they may own one or two units what's actually fascinating about that merchant or that particular entrepreneur is we are very significant to them in terms of the capital that we've invested alongside them in the business and the other thing that really came through during the pandemic was how committed they were to keeping the business going. And then we work with them um, through rent deferrals and other agreements to help them with their cash flow. And we've done exceedingly well on the other side of that as they've come out stronger and better than they were going in. There were a number of weaker uh, single tenant tenants that came out during the pandemic but they were kind of struggling before the pandemic. And what was interesting is even in that small shop segment of a thousand to 5,000 square feet in terms of store size um, was the number of better capitalized multi-unit operators who were looking for second generation space. So you think about it in restaurants or salons or fitness, there's, there's, you know, capital in those spaces that many of these entrepreneurs um, sought out. And, you know, I talked about it a lot in the third quarter of 20. It was a surprise. And I talked about it on the earnings call. We were surprised by not only the resilience of our core tenancy, but the demand from mm -hmm. other non national and non regional operators. It's wonderful to hear that. Um, and I guess now on a, uh, my next question is a little bit more broad and, and uh, for our students, um, you know, someone like yourself who's had great success in the industry and, um, you know, risen to a, a place where all of the students in our program aspire to be, what kind of advice do you have for someone like well, myself? Let me say this firstly, Ryan, all of my friends that I knew at your point realize I'm still the same knucklehead. <laughs> 
So they they make sure that there's no um, there's no sense of overachievement here, other than, um, you know, I my best advice to to folks would be follow your passion, have a purpose, and never ever give up. You know, it's it's not it's not the the very top of the class that necessarily does well it's people who do well in class but then you know are willing to be curious are willing to fail are willing to look stupid um and you know for me personally i i followed a very windy path i started off as an auditor realized i really wasn't a good auditor then i became a corporate securities attorney realized i really wasn't a very good corporate securities attorney went into investment banking. I enjoyed that. Um, I liked the um, I liked the challenge of starting every year with a zero and trying to find ways to add value to our clients as they pursued their plan. But then as I did that for 18 or so years, I realized that I had a much stronger desire not to be giving advice, but to actually having to make some of these decisions. And um, you know, that's that brought me in on board one of my clients uh, a little over 10 years ago, and it's gone by very quickly. Um, so I'm kind of all over the map. But, you know, I I, th I think one of the philosophies I had throughout was no one was going to outwork me. No one was going to out hustle me um, that. I always looked for opportunities that I thought would open additional doors. So, um, you know, I, I did it when I was an auditor. I, I was, you know, I remember one of my first audit clients was Giant of Landover, one of the best run grocery chains in the history of the grocery business. And um, I, I had an opportunity to have lunch with Izzy Cohen, who was the founder of it. And he was walking through my reconciliation of the cash accounts for giant food of Landover. And I learned more in those 15 minutes in terms of grace, humility, curiosity, um, that it really was inspiring to me. Uh, and, you know, I really looked for the opportunity always to learn and be curious no matter what it was. And it was sometimes to the frustration of my supervisors. Why are we doing it this way? <laughs> you know, like, have we thought about it this way? Um, and uh, not being afraid to come across as um, silly. Well, thank you. I think that's excellent advice. And, and I know myself and all of the students who will watch this will appreciate it. For what it's worth. So maybe I can toss in a, a question and I'm mindful that we're uh, getting short on time. Can we ask you to look at your crystal ball for a moment, going out maybe five, seven, ten years as to where you think things are headed, maybe from the student's perspective, that'll point to where there might be opportunities. So you mentioned that you've repositioned your portfolio since you got there. How do you plan to reposition it if you do over this coming next five, seven, ten years? And what what are you responding to? What market drivers, et cetera, would make you do that? And how do you do it? Is it M and A? Is it development? Is it more acquisitions, uh, et cetera? I think the first thing is knowing what you're good at. You know, and and the reason I start there is what's What's Bricksmore's value proposition to an investor? And I believe that our value proposition is that we are truly a value added investor in open air retail. That doesn't mean that we're going to go out and grow by acquiring a bunch of fully leased um, over market rented centers just because we want to hit some sort of demography targets or so forth. We're always focused on where can we generate attractive return on our investment? And so it, it is through a multiple of ways. It can be through external growth, where we identify undermanaged, underleased, underinvested in shopping centers, importantly, Robin, in our core markets, where we believe we can really create a lot of value 
um, not only in terms of ROI, but also a lower cap rate applied to the residual of what we've created. So, you know, that's that's what we're looking at. And I believe it's the best way to make money in our business. There's always, in my opinion, going to be demand for well-located, well-positioned, convenient, open-air shopping centers. And in terms of where we go from a market perspective, we're focusing on our capital, not shockingly, where you're seeing job growth, where you're seeing growth in the value of housing, and where, importantly, you also see a balance between supply and demand. There's some very hot growth markets, I won't pick on anyone in particular, where you know, you've know you got way too much retail. And I look at it and say, well, you know, that's, that's, that there's more risk to getting to our returns than in this great market we're currently in, where we already mm-hmm. own five assets. We don't have to guess as to what the market rent is. And we can, you know, outperform as we continue to cluster and build critical mass in that market. One of the things I think people don't appreciate about our asset class is that, you know, when you own one asset in a submarket, you're more of a rent taker. When you own a couple, you start to you start to um, be in a position to really drive top line growth that may even outperform what's happening more broadly in the market. Um, you know, I, I've seen it throughout my career. And uh, I think people say, well, yeah, you know, you get operating synergies. Yeah, you do. But more than anything, it's holding out for that additional dollar of rent. So as I think about where our company is going in the future, I, I, mm-hmm. I like the markets that we're in. I like the opportunity to continue to densify in the markets. Um, I like partnering with best in class tenants to help them achieve their growth goals. Um, And there's nothing that makes me prouder than seeing an old tired shopping center get renovated and become relevant and importantly, respect that community. I mean, some of the angriest moments I've had running this company have been when I've gone to a shopping center and seen that we were not respecting the community. You know, the landscaping looked terrible. There was trash in the parking lot. We hadn't leased it up. The lights were out. I mean, what were we saying to that, to that community? And, um, you know, some of the most phenomenal returns we've made as a company have been in very dense and urban environments hmm. where, you know, that was sort of de rigueur, you know, that no one cared. Hmm. And um, that, um, you know, I think runs against our purpose as a company. And if we can't find a way to create value for ourselves and our stakeholders, then, you know, we're not emotional about it. We move on. Um, But, you know, as I look out over the next five to seven years, um, I wish my crystal ball were clear. Um, I believe in cycles. I think, you know, the question Adam asked me earlier, if, if we could, move through a phase where it's easier to make acquisitions accretive just out of the gate Mm -hmm. (laughs) we can we can all look like geniuses um but you know barring that i i i think um you know it's it's a plan that's founded on remaining discipline raising capital when you don't need it um, finding opportunities to drive very attractive roi continuing to what i call institutionalize the relationship with our key tenants. What do I mean by that? The leasing person isn't the only person who has the relationship. The legal person has a relationship. I encourage our legal team to actually get out and meet in person the legal teams of our tenants. Take them out to dinner. You know, build that trust. We will we will drive better outcomes to our construction teams, to our operating teams. Um, I, I always want to get the company that slight lean that happens when you build trust and it's a multiple level relationship. Um, so, sorry, I got off on a little bit of a tangent oh, there. No. That's right. how I think about it. Yeah, very, very helpful. Very interesting. Um, Adam, I, I see we're almost out of time. You want to close us out? Uh, well, Jim, I, I guess the classic question to close out questioning is always what question should we have asked that we didn't? 
I think you've got, I think there've been really wonderful questions. And, you know, Ryan, um, I'm excited that you and your classmates are interested in our industry because I think it's a wonderful place to begin a career. It's a wonderful place to end a career. I think it's creative, it's physical, it's tangible. It also has a lot of elements of technology that are driving and helping the business evolve. Um, and, you know, it's, it's also one of the businesses that I've been in where you have competitors, but you're friends with each other. Um, and, you know, I've built many long and enduring friendships and relationships with people that are running other platforms, which is something that I enjoy quite a quite a great deal um so um i really appreciate the interest and questions and uh appreciate the opportunity to speak with you jim it's uh, really nice of you to spare the time obviously it's a most one of, for all of us our most precious resource so we really appreciate it certainly you're in you got to get leases done adam so <laughs> <laughs> uh we it's, it's super appreciated and uh you know, I think I think you can you can see from Ryan, and it's just a very very high caliber and quality of student and student interest in 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 what what you're doing and what all of us are doing in the real estate world. So this is just an invaluable uh, resource that we're creating. Thank you for contributing to it. Thank you, and thank you, Scott, for making this possible, and Robin and Adam as well, and to Brian, you and your fellow students. We have a great intern program. Check it out. Um, <laughs> oh, I will. Others, others in the industry do as well. Um, and we're all collectively very focused on talent, making sure we're bringing in great, bright, young people to help us drive it forward. So be, be careful what you wish. Be careful. <laughs> this has been one of the more optimistic, upbeat uh, discussions we've had in a while. So I suspect the, the flood is coming. <laughs> <laughs> Good, bring it. You know, as I as I often say, great real estate matters, but great talent matters far more. So, uh, we we would welcome the interest. Well, thanks so much. On that note, Thank really you. appreciate. Yeah, it was great to see you.